So you've deployed your first Kubernetes cluster, you've created a bunch of container images, you've learned how to write YAML, and you've started deployments. You're mastering kubectl, you have three Kubernetes nodes, you start deploying pods. One by one, developers' productivity goes up. You add load balancers, ingresses, life is good. Until we run out of space. So the whole point of the cloud and Kubernetes is to have the ability to scale. We want to be able to add new nodes as our existing ones become full. And as the demands drop, we want to be able to delete those nodes and scale them down. But it's not always as simple as that. Kubernetes has a scheduler. The scheduler's job is to schedule pods onto nodes. Let's say we have one machine, four cores of CPU. We start deploying pods. Now by default, Kubernetes uses best effort quality of service to schedule pods, meaning that pods will be treated with lowest priority. They can use all of the CPU and all of the memory, but will be killed if the system runs out of memory and will take low priority when scheduling onto nodes. On the surface, this might seem okay when starting out, but as the box gets full, things get messy. That's why it's important to add CPU and memory request and limits. When you do this, Kubernetes will give you guaranteed quality of service, high priority, when you tell Kubernetes that your service needs, for example, 500 millicores of CPU, it'll make better informed scheduling decisions when placing your pod onto nodes, kind of like Tetris. So if you're new to this channel, everything I do is on GitHub. If you check out the source code, I have a Kubernetes folder. And in the Kubernetes folder, I have an auto scaling folder. And everything we're going to be doing in this video is in the readme file. So as part of the series, we're going to be taking a look at Kubernetes auto scaling. We're going to take a look at cluster auto scaling as well as horizontal pod auto scaling. So remember to check out the link down below to the source code so you can follow along. Now, as an engineer, we like to deploy stuff to Kubernetes. So I have this example application that we're going to be deploying. This is a small application written in Golang that every time it receives a request, it generates some CPU load. So you can see I have a Kubernetes cluster with one node. And if we take a look at the source code, I have a Kubernetes auto scaling folder. And inside that, I have a components folder with an example application. In here, I have app.go with a Docker file and a deployment file. So to build this application, I'm going to change directory to that applications folder, and I'm going to say docker build dot minus t and i'm going to tag this as an application dash cpu version one so that's going to go ahead and build up a docker container with our example app that we're going to deploy to kubernetes now to push it up to a registry i can run docker push and push the application to Docker Hub. Now, if we take a look at our deployment YAML file, it's a very simple file that describes a deployment to Kubernetes. So in here, we just name it application-cpu. We're going to be deploying one replica, and here is the container spec. We call it application CPU, and we pass in our image, and we also expose port 80. And the interesting part here is that we're gonna be putting some resource requirements for our application. So we're gonna tell Kubernetes that we request 50 megs of, of memory and 500 millicores of CPU. Remember that one core of CPU equals a thousand millicores. So we should be able to deploy two of these instances per CPU core of our Kubernetes node. So to deploy that, I'm going to say kubectl apply minus F, and I'm going to deploy that YAML file. That's going to create our deployment, and it's also going to create a service that will expose our application so we can access it in the browser. So if we run kubectl get pods O wide, we can see we have one pod up and running on our node. Now, the interesting part is when we say kubectl top pods, we can see that our application is currently using zero millicores and seven megabytes of memory. If we say kubectl top nodes, we can see that our Kubernetes node is using 117 millicores of CPU, which is 3%, and uses 866 megabytes of memory. That's 16% of the total of memory available on the box. So how does kubectl know the metrics of our pods and also know the metrics of our node? Well, this is where metric server comes in. Metric server is a component that runs in the Kubernetes control plane that provides crucial metrics like CPU and memory back to the Kubernetes API server. Kubernetes can then use this for built-in auto-scaling pipelines like cluster auto-scalers, horizontal and vertical pod auto-scalers. The metric server is available on GitHub and it's maintained by the community. If you have a Kubernetes cluster, you can say kubectl get pods in the cube system namespace and this will show you the metric server running in the kube system namespace if you have it installed already. You can check out
out the documentation it's very straightforward to deploy you simply pick the release you want and and download the yaml file so as part of this demo i've went over to the releases page and i've taken the 0.3.7 and i downloaded this components.yaml file under the kubernetes auto scanning components file i've created a metrics server folder and i've added the metrics server.yaml in here so even though i already have it installed i'm going to install it anyway to show you the process but i just say kubectl apply and i apply that metric server yaml file that'll go ahead and update the metric server running in our cluster once you have metric server deployed it may take a couple of minutes for pod metrics and node metrics to come available now there's two very important points when it comes to auto scaling the first one is to make sure you understand cpu and memory usage of your pods running in your cluster use your monitoring to get this information and number two it's important to set resource requests and limits on your pods and deployments this will help kubernetes make smart decision that we're going to be looking at now in terms of auto scaling so if we take a look at our deployment.yaml, we can see I've set resource requests and limits. The request values is what's important to allow Kubernetes to make those smart scheduling decisions. So I've indicated here that I need 50 megabytes of memory and that I need 500 milli cores of CPU. So given I have a four core machine in my cluster, one core equates to roughly 1024 milli cores. So I'm going to multiply this by four. And this is the total number of milli cores that I should have in my cluster. And if I divide this by 500, we can see I can deploy roughly eight pods to a machine before that box will become full. This means that the scheduler can make more informed decisions about where to place our pods if we have more than one node running in the cluster. Now to simulate us deploying applications to our node, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale up this deployment to two replicas. Now when I do this, we can see that we're adding more pods to the same node. When we say kubectl top nodes, we can see that the utilization on the node is still the same. But when I say kubectl describe node there's a little section that's very important which is about allocated resources we can see that we have requested 43 percent of the cpu on this box already and let's see what happens when i scale up to three pods if i do kubectl describe node now and i take a look at the allocated resources we can see we're now using 56 percent of cpu so as we scale up our pods given we have request values on cpu we're allocating more cpu to our pods so Kubernetes is able to tell us exactly how much CPU it's using and how much it has left. Now, what happens when our developer team start deploying more and more applications? To simulate that, let's scale up to 12. And let's say kubectl get pods, and we can see that all of these pods are now in pending state. So this means we've run out of space on our node. And if I say kubectl describe pod, and I describe one of these pods, we can see zero out of one nodes are available, insufficient CPU. And if we say describe node, we can also see that we're at capacity. Now, given this has happened to our cluster, this could have caused an outage also usually this is the time when everyone comes together and starts to make a decision on whether or not we should be adding the nodes to our cluster and then manually going and adding those machines and scaling up but not today now if we take a closer look at the kubectl describe pod command on one of the pods that were in a pending status and we scroll down to the events we can see that we have an event called triggered scale up by the cluster auto scaler and it says pod triggered scaling up from one to two maximum five nodes this is because we have the kubernetes cluster auto scaler deployed in our cluster so the scheduler has now triggered the cluster auto scaler since it requires more space in the cluster and just a few moments later if i go kubectl get nodes we can see that a second node has been added to the cluster automatically and if i do kubectl get pods we can now see that all the pods have been successfully scheduled across these two nodes so this means that no one had to get up at night to scale up our cluster we also did not have to have any form of human interaction to make that decision and manually scale that cluster up it's very important that we put resource requests and limits on our deployments so that the scheduler can make smart decisions when scheduling and also understand when it runs out of capacity and it's able to trigger the cluster order scaler the cluster autoscaler is also part of the Kubernetes community, and it's also on GitHub under the Kubernetes autoscaler GitHub repo. They have full documentation about the cluster autoscaler and what cloud providers are supported. Now, it's also important to remember that there is logic in the cluster autoscaler that serves each different cloud provider. So it's very important to deploy the right cluster autoscaler 
for your cloud provider. So if we take a look at this, they have an AWS one. So AWS has a cluster auto scaler, which you can deploy following the AWS instructions here. Now the cluster auto scaler for Amazon relies on the auto scaling groups for EC2 instances. So basically the cluster auto scaler will talk to Amazon auto scaling groups and trigger a scale up of the EC2 instances whenever your cluster needs to scale up. For Microsoft Azure, it's pretty similar. So there's multiple deployment manifests available for Azure, such as virtual machine scale sets, standard virtual machines, as well as AKS. So in my example here, I've used a simple AKS cluster. I said AZ AKS create, and I created a cluster and enabled the auto scaler with this flag. So I just say enable cluster auto scaler, set the minimum and maximum number of nodes. So it's also very important to know that every cluster auto scaler has lower and upper bounds of how high it's allowed to scale. Now let's say demand has dropped and we scale that cluster back down to four. Now we can see that if I say kubectl I'll get pods, the pods are terminating and we should be left with four pods. The cluster autoscaler should follow suit and start scaling down the cluster nodes. Now this does take a while depending on the cloud provider you're using, as well as depending on the settings you use for that cluster autoscaler. The cluster autoscaler will not aggressively scale down because there can be other pods running on that node that might be critical. So it'll take anywhere between five and 10 minutes for this node to scale down. So if I say kubectl get pods, we can see we now only have four pods. And if we say kubectl get nodes, we still have two nodes. And if I describe that second node and we take a look at the pods running, we can see that we only have the kube proxy pod running on this node. So given the demand has dropped, the cluster autoscaler will take some time and then trigger to scale this node down. And after about 10 minutes, we can see if I run kubectl get nodes, we now only have one node. So the cluster autoscaler has removed the node we no longer need. Now the cluster autoscaler works really well with the pod autoscaler, also known as the horizontal pod autoscaler or HPA. Now usually folks will start adding pods to their cluster without autoscaling. So the cluster autoscaler is a great place to start because a lot of folks don't always understand exactly how much CPU and memory their microservices and pods will need. So number one, always to keep an eye on your metrics like your Prometheus monitoring to make sure you start understanding resource requirements for your pods. Number two is to start adding resource limits and request values to your deployments. So I hope this video helps you with auto scaling your cluster nodes. So in the next video, we're going to be taking a look at the horizontal pod autoscaler that will allow you to scale pods automatically. So remember to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so you get notified when I upload. Also, be sure to check out the community page in the link down below. And if you want to support the channel even further, you can hit the join button and become a member. So as always, thank Thanks for watching and until next time, peace.